This hearing of the U.S. Uh, Senate Committee on the Judiciary Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law will come to order. Uh, thank you for your indulgence as we had to vote, and uh, appreciate uh, you being here. In recent years, data brokers have become an increasingly important sector of the economy. They've moved from traditional practices like credit reporting uh, to providing complex risk mitigation uh, services and targeted marketing for other companies. As we generate more and more information uh, through our daily activities, this information is sought by data brokers who seek to use it to help businesses and consumers make better choices. The brokering of data has uh, become increasingly valuable, where it's estimated that uh, they add uh, over $100 billion in value to the economy. Today, data brokers o operate in nearly every sector of the economy, including the world of nonprofits. Uh, nevertheless, while data brokers are an important part of the American economy, there are questions about their data storage and uh, analysis practices. Uh, in particular, how does the information they collect and analyze, or how it's in this information is used, uh, it's a matter of concern to privacy activists. Uh, today's hearing will ask the important question, how secure is the data collected by data brokers? Now, to learn uh, more about how uh, secure the personal, info or personal data is in the hands of data brokers, we've brought together a panel of distinguished experts in data security and the data broker industry. Pam Dixon is the executive director of the World Privacy Forum. Justin Harvey is the chief security officer at Fidelis. I'm also pleased that Frank Casera, Axiom's chief security officer, has agreed to testify and will tell us what they're doing in this area. Eager to hear the witnesses today, I hope this hearing as well as future work in this area will help us reach a point where we can say with confidence that the data broker industry is putting uh, the attention and resources necessary uh, to keep our data secure. I'll turn to Senator Franken for an opening statement, then I'll swear in and introduce the witnesses. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding today's hearing on data brokers and the importance of data security. In the last few years, we've seen data breach after data breach affecting both public and private networks. It has become all too clear that we need to be doing more to ensure the security of Americans' personal information. The cost of complacency is simply too high, and it's absolutely appropriate, indeed essential, that we devote special attention to the security of particularly vast databases of sensitive consumer information like those compiled by data brokers who boast that they have gathered extensive information about nearly every U.S. consumer. Now, when we talk about data brokers today, I believe we're using the definition that the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, and others have recognized we're referring to companies that are in the business of collecting information about people for the purpose of selling it to others for a variety of uses, including marketing and identity verification. We're not talking about retailers that collect information about their own customers or employees, uh, but companies that trade on the information of people with whom they generally have no direct relationship and no particular set of obligations. That is important for a couple of reasons. It means that these types of companies are largely unknown to American consumers. The average American has probably never heard of companies like Axiom, Datalogix, uh, ID and Analytics, and the many other data brokers that are out there. And the average American is almost certainly unaware of the largely unregulated space in which these companies have been operating while they've been amassing detailed information about individuals' lives. Anything from online screen names and email addresses to social security numbers and credit card information or from political affiliations and histories of charitable giving to consumer purchase data online search histories, medical conditions, and on and on and, and on. But here in the Senate, we cannot claim to be unaware. In recent years, reports by the Senate Commerce Committee under the leadership of Senator Rockefeller, the Government Accountability Office, the Federal Trade Commission, as well as consumer groups has, have been illuminating. We know beyond a doubt that the threats data brokers large databases pose for consumer privacy 
are real. Plainly, they are attractive targets for cyber criminals. Just this uh, September, Experian announced that one of its databases contained the records of 15 million consumers had been hacked and that the encryption of certain fields like social security numbers might have been compromised. So the questions we turn to today are of the utmost importance. What are data brokers doing to prevent, detect, and respond to cyber threats? Who decides which pieces of consumer information in their databases is deemed sensitive and how much protection it is afforded? To what extent is the security of their data subject to any minimum requirements or regulations? And how does this differ from data held by other types of organizations? What should Congress be doing to mitigate cyber threats or to prompt data brokers to do so themselves? Today's hearing is an opportunity to think carefully about the oversight we ought to be providing from the kinds of information data brokers are allowed to compile and sell to the conditions under which that information is retained. For my part, I believe Americans have a fundamental right to privacy. They deserve both transparency and accountability from companies that trade on the details of their lives. And should they choose to leave personal information in the hands of those companies, they certainly deserve to know that their information is being safeguarded to the greatest possible degree. I hope this hearing will help us to identify the best ways to ensure the protection of Americans' personal information. I look forward to the testimony of our three witnesses and thank them for coming, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Franken, will the witnesses please stand to be sworn in? Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate all three witnesses answered in the affirmative. I'll introduce all three of you and then uh, turn to your testimony. Ms. Pamela Dixon is the founder and chief executive of the World Policy Forum, longtime commentator and researcher on privacy-related issues. She's authored important reports on data brokers and identity theft, a former research fellow with the Privacy Foundation at Denver University Strom School of Law. She is also the author of nine books, an expert advisor to the OECD on health data, and on the editorial board of the journal Technology Science at Harvard. Mr. Justin Harvey is a Chief Security Officer at Fidelis Cybersecurity and has over 20 years of experience working at leading companies in cybersecurity and information technology. His, his primary security expertise is centered on the areas of targeted attacks, threat intelligence, security analytics, incident response, and security operations. Mr. Harvey has led incident response teams on several notable high-profile breaches, including Sony in 2011, uh, Foxconn in mainland China in 2012. He was previously CTO for Glo Global Solutions at FireEye and Chief Solutions Strategist at Medi Mandiant and uh, Hewlett, -Pack Hewlett Packard. Mr. Frank Caserta is a Chief Security Officer for Axiom uh, Corporation, one of the largest marketing technology and services companies. He's been at Axiom for over 20 years. He created and implemented the job he currently holds Nice work if you can get it that way. <laughs> Axiom's uh, first chief security officer at CSO. He's been responsible for global uh, strategy covering information and physical security. Prior to his current role, he was Axiom's chief techno or technical officer in the services division uh, where he transferred to Axiom IT data center in an industry leading data warehousing technology and IT center. Uh, Mr. Caserta also holds a number of certifications including as a certified information systems security professional. Now, all of the witnesses' testimony will be entered into the record in their entirety. I would encourage you to summarize your testimony uh, to five minutes or less. And thank you for all, uh, all of you for being here. We're really pleased with the, the panel today that we've assembled. Uh, Ms. Dixon, go ahead. Thank you. The World Privacy Forum calls on the Senate to pass minimum national security standard legislation. This is the largest remaining unregulated data store in the United States. It's time to close the gaps. Senators, I have four points to make. First, virtually nothing that data brokers have 
is unrelated to people in the United States. Literally everyone has some piece of data attached to them in some way, shape, or form. What data doesn't exist can be inferred. It creates an extraordinary network of information flows about ordinary consumers. Let's be clear. The data we're talking about is my health data. It's your financial records and it's your grandkids' genetics. Second, it is reckless and downright dangerous to not protect this vast store of information. Minimum national data security standards would serve this purpose, it would allow data brokers to conduct their business, but it would keep Americans' data safe. Third, let's be clear. This data that we're talking about is thoroughly unregulated. While entities such as hospitals are covered entities under HIPAA, when a data broker stores the exact same information, unless they are a formal business associate of a healthcare provider, the same exact data is unregulated. This applies also in the financial sector, in the educational sector, and of course in the health sector and even in the government sector. Fourth, when legislation is passed regarding the security of information that data brokers held, it's going to be extraordinarily important to keep the legislation airtight and watertight. There shouldn't be any exceptions that overcome the regulations. One of the biggest area is to, to try to define sensitive information. At this point in time, because of how data can be collated and analyzed, all data pieces end up having inferences and sensitivities. Therefore, it becomes incredibly important to ensure that all data is treated equally and is considered as sensitive. Thank you for inviting me to talk with you today, and I look forward to working with you on any forthcoming legislation. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Mr. Harvey. Good afternoon, Chairman Flake and Ranking Member Franken. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about what are known as data brokers and the related cybersecurity challenges we are now facing. There are many legitimate uh, and responsible ways to leverage sensitive information in this fashion, such as driving significant cost savings for consumers, health improvements, and so on. But breaches and other misuse of data can cause great damage. We need to harness the benefits of big data without opening the door to abuse. One major priority here is to strike the right balance between security and access. All organizations, not just big data brokers, struggle between locking down their sensitive data and making it available for use and analysis. It's the age-old security problem. Too much security disrupts productivity and too little is too reckless. Let's consider a case in point around encryption. As long as the personal information is not a credit card or something related to a person's health, there is usually not a business or legislative mandate to encrypt the data. In fact, some companies see encryption as a headache since it slows down accessing the data, and we have not seen widespread adoption of encryption to secure data while it is at rest and while it's being transported through the network. Companies clearly need to embrace encryption as a minimum be best practice. However, encryption is not a silver bullet. It's only one of many components in a strong information security program. In fact, the trust placed in encryption is sometimes misplaced. Today's intruders steal legitimate credentials to access data. In other words, they access the data just like a legitimate system administrator would. Ultimately, encryption is only as good as the weakest link in the larger data security ecosystem. Unfortunately, that weakest link is often the human factor. From clicking on a malicious link or opening up an uh, unknown attachment to being tricked into giving up someone's password like we saw with CIA Director John Brennan, people still represent the largest vulnerability we have in cybersecurity. The cybersecurity field also happens to be suffering from a huge, epic uh, information security skills shortage. Recent study found 30% of security jobs remain unfilled in America. I think that programs like One Interrupt in Boston have the right idea by teaching high school kids, uh, high school 
age kids about cybersecurity is the right approach. Get them all the young. The adage I use when advising my customers is, quote, plan for the worst. If the information is stored online, it has a significant chance of getting leaked at some point or accessed by an unauthorized third party. No data set is completely secure, no matter how much security or encryption or legislation is placed upon it. We must face and prepare for the high chance that it will be stolen and possibly leaked. Sometimes the fallout is massive. As with 21.5 million cyber attack victims in the Office of Personnel Management's database. We also use another adage quite frequently, one from my previous CEO, Kevin Mandia, which reads, breaches are inevitable. And when it happens to be dig, uh, big data brokers, the scope, scale, and sophistication of sensitive data they possess make the stakes even higher. The most obvious risk is widespread fraud. Should these data sets get leaked to the general public or so to the highest bidder, this could have cascading effects on our economy. Imagine a breach where every American's name, social security number, address, email, phone number, and mother's maiden name was leaked to the internet. The size of this data is not outside of the realm of possibility. To put this into perspective, Ashley Madison, a website for extramarital affair hookups, was breached. The incident had information on 36 million people and contained 10 gigabytes of stolen data. Given that the last U.S. Census reported a little over 320 million Americans, a whole country's worth of personally identifiable information could there be, therefore be uh, compressed into 100 gigabytes. That's a little under twice the size of the computer game Battlefield 4, which our kids play, or 10 seasons of Saturday Night Live in high def. Well, maybe 15 seasons uh, in Senator Franken's era. Uh, but that amount of data could fit on a USB drive or this uh, Apple phone. A breach of this size would have a lasting effect on the economy and national security as the government and corporations would rush to implement stopgap measures to respond to the leak. Consumers would also be harmed, as they would essentially have to change every single password and reestablish their own secure place on the Internet. Identity recovery, in other words, could be as troubling as identity theft. I'm reminded of the famous caption from a 1993 New Yorker cartoon that has since become a maxim of the digital age, quote, on the Internet, nobody knows you're a dog, end quote. Well, in the aftermath of a massive breach, you may find that on the Internet, nobody knows you're you. The information that big data brokers have collected and generated represents some of the richest metadata about citizens in the world. Metadata is that all-important data about data that helps us understand the context and usability of the information we possess. Unlike internet surveillance, which can be foiled by encryption and legislation, brokers have gotten their data firsthand from us as users. The volume, detail, and richness of information that big data brokers possess make them a prime target for breaches, especially state-sponsored cyber espionage. Nation states likely see brokers as a one-stop shop for intelligence on U.S. citizens. No need to breach 10, 50, or 100 other corporations in the U.S. when they could just go to one place or two data brokers and get all of the data. What's worse is that they don't even need to steal the data. They can simply access it by compromising a data administrator's credentials. Since I forgot my tinfoil hat at home, I won't even begin to discuss the possibility of U.S. intelligence agencies using this metadata to find threats. Nation states that have access to this rich metadata can easily track the habits of U.S. citizens for nefarious purposes. This could include shadowing uh, a target of interest, say a government employee, to discover online and real-world habits in order to gain access to Internet accounts that have sensitive info. Corporate boards must understand that the organizations that they oversee need to operate in a continuous response model by proactively hunting for breaches and implementing what we call red teams, which perform a sort of scrimmage safely against companies playing the role of a would-be attacker. A new study by HP Enterprise found that IT security spend is up 7% and that companies spend about 76% of their information security budget on blocking. Unfortunately, this isn't working. Most of all, most if not all of the breaches that we've been seeing have invested, these organizations have invested in preventative approaches, the blocking approaches versus detection and response or a continuous response model. 
Remember, it's not always about external threats or malware that you hear about in the news. Many breaches are perpetrated by insiders. I realize that my testimony today is probably drawing an uncomfortable picture of the challenges we face. We need to accept the when, not if, reality that breaches will happen. Attackers can be relentless and clever, but so can we. Fidelis is able to monitor the movement of data in real time and deploy sophisticated analytics to recognize immediately when a breach is taking place, follow the attacker's trail, and freeze them in their tracks. In closing, we are very much in the game, and it takes commitment, ingenuity, and I mentioned earlier a move from prevention to a detection and response model. We are getting better and better at finding cyber attacks, and so are the big data brokers. While we might not be able to stop all breaches, our ability to leverage big data for insights about these attacks means we're rarely in the dark and we are making progress all the time. I know I went long. I appreciate your patience, and thank you, Senators. I look forward to questions on the matter. Thank you for that very comforting <laughs> testimony, Mr. Harvey. <laughs> Mr. Caserta. Uh, Chairman Flake, Ranking Member Franken, it's my pleasure to represent Axiom at today's proceedings. Axiom has two main lines of business. We process our clients' information on their behalf, both ensuring its accuracy and analyzing it to help them find new ways to serve customers. We help our clients successfully manage audiences that they wish to reach and connect with these audiences. Through our services, our clients are able to personalize their brand experiences for their customers and create relationships that benefit both their customers and the brand. The second line of our business is information products and services, what you would call being a data broker. These are primarily for fraud detection and prevention and for marketing. At Axiom, we start with privacy. The Axiom Privacy Program is built on the ethical use of data, ensuring that the use of data products and services we provide to our clients is legal, just, and fair for all stakeholders, including the consumer. Our program includes the credentialing of clients to ensure we are working with good actors and with legitimate interests who themselves are accountable for the appropriate and ethical use of our products and services. Importantly, we have an obligation to secure both the data in our data products, our services, and our clients' data that we are stewarding. This applies to Axiom's access to data, our clients' access to their own data, and the prevention of unauthorized access and use of that data by anyone else. Regarding security, our business is data-centered, so perhaps more intensely than others, Axiom understands we have an inherent responsibility to safeguard personal information we process for our clients and information we bring to the market. We work within our industry and across the commercial spectrum and with federal, state, and international governments to develop and implement best practices for data collection, use, and protection. A strong commitment to privacy and security is a core component for our brand. Like consumer-facing companies, data companies are subject to regulation by the Federal Trade Commission and are required to employ reasonable security measures to protect systems and information. Each company decides what's, what uh, constitutes reasonable security base um, on the unique threats they face. The resulting plans companies develop are necessarily confidential to protect company security. We are happy to characterize the general parameters of Axiom Security Program. However, we can't provide so many details that we compromise our security. Further, we are not in a position to comment on other companies' internal confidential security measures. Broadly speaking, our security program is designed to exceed federal requirements for safeguarding data. We are often a leader in adopting new security techniques and protocols for the protection of data. For example, even though Axiom's marketing information products are not covered by Graham Leach Bliley Act, we nevertheless apply the GLBA safeguard rule to those products. Ultimately, Axiom's approach to information security goes beyond what is required by either the law or self-regulation and is, in fact, for Axiom, a brand trust essential. As our economy is increasingly data-driven, Axiom faces the same challenges all public and private sector operations have when using data. New technologies and data uses bring amazing opportunities to consumers, business, and governments but with that come rising threats from criminals, activists, state-sponsored espionage, and others who want to exploit the technology and data for their own purposes. It takes constant vigilance and investment to stay ahead of security challenges. The comprehensive security policies governing a company's operations must be backed with effective governance that will assure adequate protective measures are taken. Good governance models include executives focused on security, risk management, privacy, and audit. 
use of modern security control frameworks like ISO 27000 and the NIST cybersecurity framework, audit programs for independent inspection and reporting covering security effectiveness, well-executed security programs monitoring and incident response capabilities. I've expanded on this topic in the written testimony submitted by Axiom. I look forward to your questions and hope we can assist you in your mission today. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you all. Uh, Ms. Dixon, you stated in your testimony right at the beginning that uh, uh, there is basically nothing off limits uh, in this uh, in this world. What can you give some sense of uh, some information that is held by data brokers that uh, many Americans might be surprised that they have given up or that they they have? Intriguingly enough, the data actually covers almost all areas. So health finances. Let's just take some examples from that. Many Americans do not realize that if they have made an over-the-counter purchase, they may well have what's called an inferred disease that um, they actually end up on a list with that inferred disease, diabetes, heart disease, cancer even, HIV positive status, based on the things you buy and some of your activities. The other thing that's frequently on data broker lists or in their data stores is a lot of financial and uh, what I would call ownership information. The make and model of the car you own, how many children you have, the ages of your children, whether or not you graduated high school or college or graduate school, whether you rent or own a home, what's your exact income, um, do you owe money to the federal government, do you have a tax lien, all of this data is, is quite commonly held by data brokers. In some contexts, this data is actually regulated, particularly data about debt, if you are 30, 60, or 90 days late on a mortgage, for example. But when it's held by data brokers out of these contexts, then it becomes unregulated and the GLBA, um, HIPAA, and, and other federal protections for this data evaporate. Let's turn to one of the breaches uh, uh, recently. O October 1st, it was revealed that uh, Experian, one of the biggest uh, data brokers, uh, experienced a large-scale breach in the credit reporting arm. I think 15 million people had their personal information stolen by hackers, including names, addresses, social security numbers, birthdays, perhaps even driver's licenses, military IDs, IDs and passport numbers. Uh, it's been reported that according to ex-Experian uh, ex sources, Experian had been suffering from a corporate culture that failed to take security seriously. Uh, one uh, former employee said, uh, once the leadership changed, the focus changed to controlling costs and not even taking systems down for maintenance. And investments started disappearing from a lot of areas. We're in the middle of putting uh, an operation into operation certain tools to do next generation detection of cyber threats, but we weren't able to get many of them into production. That's how Experian wound up being where they are now, unquote. Uh, Ms. Dixon, do you think this is true about Experian? Is this just a culture that develops over time that you don't take security seriously? I can't speak to their internal culture, but what I can speak to is the really disturbing data breaches that they've had that have continued. There was a case where there was a pre previous Experian breach where data was literally sold to entities under investigation by the Department of Justice. They then committed fraud and then real people just people lost their homes as a result. This was an, a major FTC and DOJ investigation, and we have additional new breaches, so it's difficult to say what's going on inside, but that does give me a real indication that something is wrong. And look, in order to have a, a fix for this kind of a cultural problem and a technical problem, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. There are already good use models in place. The HIPAA security rule provides a highly complex sector with adaptable and flexible uh, minimum national security safeguards that have been implementable and helpful. And we have NIST standards already in place and uh, an agency ready to create standards. We have CFPB for larger participants and we have the FTC for uh, smaller players, we've, we've got the tools that we need to create these uh, minimum requirements. And if we had examinations of companies on um, national security uh, requirements or security standard requirements, I think it would go far 
to correcting that kind of lax behavior. Mr. Harvey, what uh, security measures would have been, could have been uh, adequate uh, for the sort of operation that Experian had? Would something like the HIPAA model, something been, been applied? Would that have uh, no. prevented? No. Nope. Uh, you see it across the board, PCI, the payment card industry, uh, data security standards, which is known as DSS, the HIPAA standards. These types of standards are uh, give uh, organizations a low bar to aspire to. It's the bare minimum, and they, all of these standards were written uh, 5 to 10 to 15 years ago when there were no state-sponsored espionage against uh, being conducted against um, uh, corporations in America. Take, for instance, the Anthem breach. They were HIPAA compliant, but they still lost all of, of their records. And what's necessary is to focus on a few points, like uh, mandatory encryption for all private data. And we can, we can go to the experts on what, what private or sensitive data is. Uh, moving from a prevention model to detect and respond. There is a gap here where uh, we call it uh, the dwell time from when there's an attack and when you discover it. Do you know what the average is last year? 205 days. That means, on average, an attacker could be in an organization for seven months without being detected. We have to get that down to days, if not hours, if not minutes. Um, and then finally, uh, there's just simply not enough people out there, not enough trained cybersecurity uh, workers, um, in any market, let alone the large ones, uh, consider the smaller towns that have large corporate headquarters. It's very difficult to hire and retain uh, skilled cybersecurity talent there. So um, what's needed is, uh, is a higher bar, something that really focuses on being more data-centric versus uh, uh, legislation or laws that are, or, or standards that are 10 to 15 years old. Uh, NIST doesn't address the privacy of the data. Um, the federal government uses NIST, but it's still getting breached. So we need to we need to think about how we change the game. Uh, and and finally, it's not it's not CISA. It's not uh, th it's not threat intel sharing. Threat intelligence is only as good as the last person it was um, it was affected by. So a lot of the attacks that are being perpetrated today are, are what is known as zero day or their signature list, which means um, they've never been uh, they've never been seen before. So in those cases, um, sharing threat intel with the government would not have helped. My time is up. Mr. Franken. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have the feeling that Fidelis has a detection and response model. That's what I kind of got out of your testimony. A little bit. Yeah. But, it's, uh, but I would also say that it is not... Well, uh, let me ask a question okay. first. <laughs> <laughs> You've had your time. Uh, no. Uh, Ms. Dixon, am I hearing any disagreement here between uh, uh, you, Mr. Harvey? I mean, there's a difference between, uh, you know, oversight of what we have to do. You were talking about perhaps the CFPB or the FTC establishing oversight. Um, how does that uh, play into the kind of security that Mr. Harvey is talking about? Is there any uh, – uh, put both of your testimony together for me, would you? Absolutely, and thank for you. For your responses. So I still like the idea of a minimum national security standard for data brokers. We have to start somewhere. We have to start in a place where we don't have to stand up a new federal agency and we've got to work with the tools that are on hand. The, the HIPAA security rule, if you can imagine a world without that rule, I don't want to, personally. I mean, we already have data breaches, but I believe we would have had many, many more. It does have and does provide a measure of accountability and effectiveness, and I think it's an important starting <coughs> point. Now, I agree that these rules were written at an earlier time. However, they're adaptable, they're flexible, and updatable. And this is exactly the kind of technology neutral um, standard that we need so that we don't bring business to a screeching halt, but that we also, at the same time, provide protection and uh, some risk, you know, help for
for Americans who have their data stored typically without their knowledge at these companies. And these decisions that uh, the data is used for can really impact their lives. So I really like the idea of a minimum standard. It can be a floor, not a ceiling. And okay. let's start there. Um, well, let's say uh, the Senate and the House were legislating bodies, OK? And um, uh, what sh how, how should Congress address this? Legislation would be a great first step addressing the issue of what data is collected, where it's stored, how it's stored, looking at the privacy and security safeguards, all of the baseline things that we already see in models like the HIPAA security rule and even the <coughs> safeguards rule in GLBA and even some of the rules in FERPA. There's a lot yep. of models to pull from. In the meantime, uh, what steps could the executive branch take under its existing authorities to protect Americans' personal information? I think the existing authority that we have right now would fall under FTC Act Section 5, Unfair and Deceptive Business Practices. I think that would be a good start. I like that Axiom is, um, in a voluntary way, um, holding their market marketing data under uh, GLBA. That gives consumers the opportunity to opt out. If this could become a best practice across the industry, that would be fantastic. I would like to note that, to its credit, Axiom created the About the Data portal. I have noticed that not one single other data broker in the industry of thousands of data brokers has done anything similar that allows us to see our data and then opt out. I'm not saying that Axiom is perfect. I'm not going to give you that free pass. However, that is an important first I think step. that's why Axiom is here. <laughs> right. As but I look, that's an important first step, and we shouldn't minimize that, that important Thank step. That's, that's certainly a good place to start. And thank you, Mr. Caserta, for being here. Mr. Harvey, um, you've spoken about the inadequacy of focusing on threat intelligence sharing and the need for other uh, measures. Um, you've sort of laid out what you think uh, would best protect us, which is a uh, detection and response model. Um, do you think it'd be possible for the federal government to impose um, effective uh, minimum baseline data security standards that would improve the security of data brokers? And Mr. Cassara, you can certainly feel free to answer this as well. Uh, I believe so. I think that the uh, uh, Ms. Dixon great, did a great job in, in discussing the, the need for minimum requirements. Uh, the one thing that I didn't hear you mention is the EU's GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, that which is to be uh, instituted in uh, 2018. Uh, now, I'm not a, a big fan of following everything that the Europeans do, but in this, I think that um, it specifies in a much greater detail the handling of, of private data, uh, breach notification uh, timeline, which is really important since in the U.S., uh, breach notification laws and regulations differ from state to state. It would be helpful to have one single uh, standard across the board. Uh, and I do believe there is a way for uh, the legislative branch to recommend. But Senator, Senator Leahy has a breach notification. Uh, Correct. But for, uh, for, for the technical uh, aspect, yes, um, uh, to be able to recommend and require companies. And it's not just... Uh, um, Mr. Caserta's firm or other data brokers, I believe that if an organization, regardless of commercial, government, defense, whatever, has private or sensitive data, then they should be, they should fall under the same guidelines. Yeah, I'd um, iterate that as well. We've been supporting um, a move towards uh, breach notification laws for about 10 years, and they've stalled out for a variety of reasons uh, in the legislative bodies over the years, but it would be helpful because it's very distracting and challenging to figure out how to, to navigate all that and to know when you're right or wrong. Mm -hmm. As to the overall regulation, you know, with the FTC and the other rules, it's interesting. Our client base also has uh, a fair amount of regulations in the financial services industry and things like that. They apply those rules to us, even if the direct regulating authority does not. Since they're accountable for the business they do with us, they extend those same rules and they audit us to those rules. Um, so we're indirectly regulated that way as well. 
So for large companies, you know, regulated companies, those rules are being applied. That regulation is extending out into the third parties quite a bit. Oh, thank you, thank you uh, for uh, letting me go a little over. You bet. Thank your you, indulgence. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, over the years, I've worked to reform this area where consumers can be so much at risk of abuse and privacy invasion. And I will be introducing the Do Not Track Online Act, which would give consumers a way to indicate that they essentially wish to block their personal information from being collected by providers of online services. Unlike the voluntary efforts that industry has promised from time to time but never really delivered, my legislation would give consumers recourse and a remedy if their privacy preferences are ignored. This bill is essentially the same bill that Senator Rockefeller and I introduced during a previous session, it would provide real rights and a means to enforce them against the abuses and overreach and intrusive practices that have become all too common, indeed endemic, to much of this industry. Uh, Ms. Dixon, I think, essentially I know the answer to this question, but you would support that kind of legislation. Yes, I'm, of course I'd like to see it and I look forward to reading it and working with you on it. I think it's incredibly important to attack this problem from a multiplicity of angles and at a lot of different layers. So yes, I would support that legislation. The bill would provide very limited exceptions but would prohibit online providers from collecting personal information from individuals who indicate such a preference. I take it from your testimony that you would reject the notion that the market or competition among individuals in the industry is sufficient to protect consumers. I'm afraid that I'm not able to say that that is happening uh, correctly as it should. We have a lack of balance right now in the market that has not been sufficient to correct that problem. In your testimony, you point out that context is very important to assessing whether a particular piece of information is sensitive or not. Uh, a lot of Americans, for example, feel that their home address is not sensitive information. No. But an American, and most especially a woman who has been stalked or abused or has fled a situation of abuse, may feel very strongly and understandably that a home address is in fact sensitive information. If a consumer de decides that her personal information is sensitive and should not be brought, bought or sold by data brokers, can she stop her information from being bought and sold right now? Not right now and I agree with you completely about how information is contextual. That is what makes this issue so tremendously challenging. I became incredibly sensitized to the issue of home address through my work with the National Network to End Domestic Violence. And women who you would think, okay, home address, no problem, email address, no problem, but for them it was a life-threatening situation. So this did sensitize me as to how even information that is deemed public information can be a safety threat. And uh, it is, it becomes complex to solve that problem. So the opt-out, that allows a person to decide when they have a problem is incredibly important to accomplish. So yes, I, I agree. I think that's a good solution. In fact, the uh, Senate Commerce Committee, where I also sit, conducted an in-depth inquiry into the practices of nine major data brokers. And in response to the committee's questions, we found some companies actually sell profiles that define consumers in categories or score them without the consumer's permission, often without their knowledge. Those categories included, quote, rural and barely making it, end quote, or, quote, ethnic second city strugglers, end quote, or, quote, retiring on empty, end quote. My belief is that consumers themselves are in the best position, most knowledgeable, 
and best equipped to decide whether a particular piece of information is sensitive to that consumer herself. Would you agree? I agree, absolutely. And you're absolutely correct. In an era of big data, data, the, the pieces of information that data brokers have about us don't just sit there. They can be combined to create new data and new inferences, and that's what creates those categorizations. And I worry about a world in which people are categorized in ways that they are not aware of. And I would like to see people aware of these categorizations and given real choice about what happens to them based on those. Well, this legislation would require clear, unequivocal notice to the consumer about the collection and use of that information and would require affirmative consent to that use. In other words, essentially consent, knowledgeable, fact-driven by the consumer based on his or her situation. And you are absolutely right. We live in an era of big data, in fact, an era of bigger and bigger data, which makes the consumer sometimes smaller and smaller in her ability to control how that information is used. And so I think this legislation ought to gain momentum and hopefully the very informational hearing that we're having today will help drive that momentum. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. I've just arrived. I was uh, on the floor with a colleague who invited me to his uh, maiden speech. So I wanted to uh, show him the courtesy of attending. And I, but I appreciate this very much, and I appreciate uh, your attention on the uh, privacy concerns that all this data uh, being out there creates. Um, I think there is at least a thread of thought that if it is the government that is collecting data of any kind, then there are dramatic immediate harms that occur virtually from that fact. But if it's the private sector collecting data, almost no amount of intrusion into your electronic profile, into your emails, into your conversations, into uh, where you go and when you're there and all of that uh, is a problem. And I wonder if I could just ask each of you as we wrap up to speak about what you see as the most significant privacy dangers that would come from a pure private sector misuse of this sort of big data for a regular individual. Let me start with uh, Ms. Dixon and go right across to Mr. Harvey and Mr. Caserta. Thank you. The thing I worry about the most with this is data that's layered. So for example, census data that includes your zip code layered with other financial and lifestyle data that is then used to determine the kinds of offers that you see, for example, for credit, for educational opportunities, and even for job opportunities. That's what worries me because this puts people based on their zip code and other factors about themselves that they cannot change. It puts them into a bubble that's not necessarily of their own making. And to me, that's just plain un-American. I still believe in the American dream. And I'd like to see data help us achieve our dreams, not hinder them. So that's the thing I worry the most about. So I would like to see legislation that provides minimum security standards for data brokers so we have less risk of that data um, being subject to fraudulent use and criminal abuse. But I would also like to see the ability for all of us to have the right to shape our digital exhaust that we have just from living our daily lives. Good afternoon, Senator. Uh, the, 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 
I, I've broken it down into a few areas. The first is just the inability to correct the data. So we have about a minute given right. the time we're working under, so try to keep I'll, it. I'll be brief. Uh, nice. The inability to correct the data once it's out there uh, with these big data stores is very difficult to unwind given that the way that big data analytics operates. Uh, the second one would, of course, be the right to be forgotten. Uh, on a uh, on a uh, on a larger scale, I uh, am concerned with um, there being a big breach where all of our personal data is out in the open and instead of an attacker selling it, an attacker would leak it to the internet. We saw them do that with Ashley Madison. If we were to do that, if someone were to do that with our personal data, let's just say all of our name, address, social security numbers and phone numbers and email addresses, they could essentially reset all of our passwords. They could wreak havoc on, uh, on every single online service trying to impersonate us. And then finally, it's the, the state-sponsored aspect of this. Uh, like I had mentioned earlier, um, if an attacker were to get access to this data, a nation state-sponsored uh, think cyber espionage or cyber terrorism, uh, they would have basically a treasure trove of data to, to mine and to look through in order to abuse in a multitude of ways. And finally, Mr. Caserta. Thank you. <clears throat> so we just, we have a privacy practice that focuses a lot on that element. They would probably go into a lot better detail on the ethical use of that data, and we spend a lot of time working on those issues. From my perspective in the security world, it's the data breach aspects. Those are the things that I worry about the most. It's where I spend most of my time looking at the challenges with the technical aspects that a lot of companies are operating with, the uh, Internet and privacy challenges that come with that, uh, looking at um, – how to source the individual technical skills and people to work on these challenges. It seems like the bad guys can grow them faster than the good guys can at times. So those are some of the more pragmatic things that I'm worried about day to day on the security side, but we couple that 100% in that privacy context. Thank you. Let me follow on my last round of questions had to do with Experian and that uh, data breach there. Ms. Caserta, I didn't have time to get to you. Uh, to the extent that that was uh, kind of a corporate culture uh, described by an ex-employee, is that endemic of uh, data uh, brokers? Or well, I certainly how, how hope is your, not. How is your company different? <laughs> I certainly hope that's not endemic, but the cultural aspect is something we tackled head on uh, many years ago because ultimately as a data company, we have a lot of people that work with data, and the better trained they are, the more aware they are, uh, in understanding how to apply appropriate security, how to apply encryption, how to be aware of phishing attacks and other sorts of intrusions that come into the corporate world, the more effective our security program would be. So we invest in quite a bit of training. We have mandatory security and privacy training for all associates in our company, and uh, I get the luxury of revoking their access from our network if they don't complete that training. Okay. So uh, that's an interesting uh, combination sometimes. But the um, the idea is, is to... to, to put it in an enterprise risk framework and make sure that we're having an executive and board dialogue around real risks. What's substantive? What are we dealing with? Where do we need investments? Uh, and it's not just security. It's, you know, upgrade aging systems. It's, it's a culture of evergreening and moving forward to make sure that you can maintain a decent security posture. Okay. Let's turn to the, uh, the OPM hack. Uh, it's increasingly clear that our strategic competitors have an interest in that. That was a lot of government data and security data with regard to intelligence uh, or officials in our intel intelligence business. But what uh, is there a threat, um, Mr. Harvey, you seem to think so, uh, from our strategic competitors or uh, other nation states uh, to receive, or I'm sorry, to, to hack uh, this data? And if so, can't they just buy it? It's certainly possible that they could uh, they could buy access in legitimate ways through uh, proxy groups, uh, just like we've seen uh, suspected Russian state-sponsored uh, espionage operating through proxy groups in Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm sure that uh, our uh, close allies, uh, sarcastically, uh, could both do the same. Uh, but it is absolutely. A, uh, a danger for this data to be accessed by or uh, leaked to um, uh, nations that want to conduct uh, espionage operations against the U.S. Like I said before, it's easy for them to, it's like the 7-Eleven of, of data. Go to a data broker, hit them up, or get access to it, a data administrator's console, access the data, uh, rather than go hit 
10, 20, 30, 40 other uh, organizations. Mr. Caserta, is there a difference between the data available for purchase uh, from a data broker and that that is held by the data broker? Yes, there are differences. We have uh, marketing data elements that are, you know, very generic in terms of, you know, categorizing and looking at uh, buying patterns, things like that. There's also um, basically identity data that's used as, rep we call it reference data, and it's used to specifically do things in the um, identity verification world. That data is much more granular, and it is extremely restricted in how it can be used. The use cases around that data and how we let somebody have access to something like that is, is very intense, very limited, very small part of our business. The marketing data is uh, quite a bit uh, larger in terms of the data broker side of what we do. And then our hosting services, we're managing a lot of data types for a lot of companies that come through for the integration services and enhancement work that we do for them. So we end up using uh, a pretty high bar for security across all three categories of data because from a security perspective, none of them are less important than the others in terms of you know trust with our clients. The question was asked of Ms. Dixon if uh, legislation were being written, what, uh, in what form should it take? Let me ask you, uh, in terms of uh, legitimate business and making consumers' lives uh, uh, easier and everything else, what, where should we tread lightly here? And, and what would, should we be concerned about and where can industry act uh, on its own to police itself? I know our privacy group spends a lot of time on that topic in terms of the beneficial use of data and, and so forth. I do think that data breach notification and other things like that could be helpful and it's one of those areas in, in looking at because it confuses consumers when they get so much notification for so many things. Uh, the tendency today is really to over notify, just you know, to be you know, extra careful when you uh, incur a situation, whether there's a harm trigger or not. So there's a lot of things that go into that kind of legislation. Uh, but I know from the security perspective, the, the breach notification areas are something that, that definitely needs some retooling. See some kind of uniform standard there uh, yes. among the industry. Yeah, preempt all this uh, different state legislation and everything that we're dealing with. Yeah. Thank you. Senator Franken. Uh, thank you. That's interesting. Unless maybe the state is tougher, but... Uh, Mr. Caserta, when you tell people you work for Axiom, do they know what, do they have any idea what, what it is you do? Generally not. I yeah. mean, it is definitely um, um, a power behind the brands, right? You know, we tend to, to be the, the, the processing behind a lot of other brands to help them do what they need to do. Sure. But we've stepped out a little more recently in that front. Well, um... It's just that I think people are not aware of what's being, what information is being taken about them. I think that, isn't that fair to say? I think it's fair to say. It's one of the reasons we did about the data.com was the way to get people a chance to look at some of that data and, uh, and get an idea of what it is we do have and what a data broker can do. And I think that's helpful, and I yeah. think we could, we could see more of that. Is that the w w website where consumers can see information that's been collected about them? Yes, the information that we've collected about them. Okay, and um, and they can opt out of certain marketing yes. programs? Okay. Yes. But many of your competitors don't offer that, right? Uh, as far as I know, they do. Right. And there's no, certainly no uniform law requiring that kind of basic transparency and accountability? No. Okay, well, that's why I'm the co-sponsor of, of Senator Blumenthal's data broker Accountability and Transparency Act, I think Senator Markey's, and now it was Rockefeller's, and which would address that gap and give, because I, I do think that people have a right to know what's being taken and to give permission. Um, do you think it's time at all, all companies did what your company's doing? So I probably don't know that I could speak for all companies like that, but we thought enough about it to do it. Okay, I'll take that as an answer. No, it isn't. My goodness. You can speak as yourself as an individual, can't you? So it's hard to, you know, okay, separate yourself I'm from sorry, the company. <laughs> you got to go to the conferences. I understand. Um, uh, okay. The, my understanding is that today, even when a consumer uh, is given the chance to opt out of certain marketing programs, um, 
that uh, your company, that a company like Axiom may stop selling the information for marketing purposes, but may still keep the information in its databases uh, where it remains at risk for being part of a, a, in a data breach. Is that your understanding as well? In a limited fashion, yes. We do clean out data on a periodic basis. Uh, you know, obviously a key security strategy is to limit the footprint of how much data you have over time. We're much more interested in keeping current data and not necessarily keeping years and years of stale data, which just, you know, can represent a, a risk. Um, now, I, do I understand from your testimony that, I mean, some data is considered very personal and very sensitive data, but I don't think there are legal definitions for that, are there, Ms. Dixon? There is not a consistent legal definition of what constitutes sensitive information. There's one for Europe, there's one for various sectors, and then there's a variety of self-regulatory definitions. Well, Mr. Harvey seems to be a big fan of Europe. <laughs> Am I right? Uh, I like uh, I like French food once in a while. Okay, but, uh, well, but I meant that they have, do, do they do this in a better way, define this in a better way than we do? Uh, I haven't looked at the okay. legislation enough to comment on that. Okay. Um, how do you decide in, within Axiom uh, which is uh, particularly private and sensitive information, which isn't? Uh, so our privacy group goes through a lot of the legislation, a lot of the uh, governing bodies for marketers. They go, they do this globally, and they synthesize out for us a list of data that they consider to be sensitive and rest or restricted. And they apply those rules to every data product and every data service that we provide. Uh, so we're trying to set the bar high and understand where that goes. They also look at uh, what they call the creep factor. Is it something that... Uh, is just not even appropriate for consumers, regardless of its regulatory nature. And they apply those rules uh, to the company. Okay, Ms. Dixon, uh, what is your understanding of how data brokers decide what is and isn't uh, sensitive information, and what should we d be doing to harmonize this across the industry? This is a difficult issue because the sensitivity is defined contextually by both consumers and by companies. So in my written testimony, I've, I've, I've listed three different definitions of sensitive data. One is Axiom's definition in one of its B2B contracts. And the other, one is from the uh, Network Advertising Initiative and one's from the um, DAA. Both are self-regulatory kind of ad network, you know, self-regulatory programs. And in all of those definitions, it's so frustrating because medical data is defined in a very focused, narrow way. And right now, we know that health data is becoming defined more broadly with Fitbits and Apple Watches and health data being gathered and collected outside of the constraints of, of HIPAA. So the very narrow definitions of, for example, a medical diagnosis is sensitive data compared with, oh, well, maybe genetic information is, you know, sensitive data. Basically, what ends up happening is that each company then ends up, in, through no fault of its own, but they use their own filters to determine what constitutes sensitive, and no one agrees on what this is. That's a problem. Yes, that's an issue for us to contend with. Thank you again for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry I'm late. My, uh, one of my freshman colleagues gave his maiden speech today. Uh, very patient. He waited a year, actually, to do it. That's remarkable. How was it? It was great. It's actually the best. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here today. I, I want to start with, uh, is it Caserta? Either uh, Mr. Harvey or Mr. Caserta. And uh, I worked in a data analytics practice. I worked in two different industries that uh, use the information to know more about the customer and then kind of use that information to be instructive in terms of the customer experience and giving the customers more value. So I think there's a lot of positive that can come from the use of this information. The, uh, the real question is how do you manage abuses and, uh, and then how do you protect uh, the risk, privacy, a number of other factors. Uh, but when you have this problem come up, you know, I've never seen government, um, never saw a problem that government didn't want to overregulate. And I think that there's a big risk that some of the upside, some of the positive aspects of 
using this data could be at risk if we uh, react and uh, come up with a government solution before uh, industry has been able to come up with uh, their own sorts of standards. Can you give me some sense about where we are in the industry and what things we could look to to, uh, to address some of the concerns with respect to uh, exploitation or respect to uh, privacy, privacy concerns, having the customer have right, uh, maybe some right or vehicle for opting out if they choose not to have their information uh, brought into the fold and the, the risk, the benefits or risk of having this kind of discuss or that consideration? We'll start with you, Mr. Caserta. Okay, there are a number of angles in that. I'm going to try to cover some of that. Um, so from a, from a privacy perspective, you know, it's, it's maintaining an understanding of um, what is appropriate use of that data, and then from a security perspective, looking to detect fraudulent use of that data. So somebody may have perfectly legitimate reason to look at something, but then you start to look at how they're using the data, the access patterns around the data, and you ask the question, is that legitimate? Uh, we have to do that with some of our more sensitive risk data products where we actually monitor the type of uh, inquiries that come in on that data for inappropriate uh, access. Uh, doing that at scale, I think, has some technical challenges, but I think it's one of the directions in the future that we would do, be doing more of. And I think that would be a, um, a serious consideration over time, how, how to put fraud detection on top of data use. Are you going to be able to keep up with the pace of, uh, it, it is a big order because you're, you're, you're providing access to enormous sums of data in real time with billions or potentially trillions of transactions. So how are you going to stay ahead of the curve and, and convince us that the industry can deal with the potential exploitation? I think setting, setting the self-regulation out there and the work that we do uh, is helpful. Um, again, you know, I look at the, the nature of breach notification and how hard it is to get out, what type of data breach, what was the impact, where did it come from? Because a lot of the security industry learns from the mistakes of what has occurred, uh, tends to try and close gaps. The hard part is to predict what has not happened yet. Uh, some of the intelligence discussions that are going on out there have potential to help with some of that, but very challenging to make it useful. Um, so I do think that the, the risk management practice of understanding the risk of the data, putting a proper governance process in place to understand that you're going to time your investments with that data, that you're going to upscale your security, you're going to upscale your infrastructure and make sure that all of your security program is kept in line with that data is a critical aspect that has to occur. Hey, Mr. Harvey, similar line of questions. I know we covered a lot of ground there, so you can pick and choose with the uh, time I have remaining, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, coming from uh, be, a vendor doing cybersecurity, uh, I, I think we kind of look at this in a couple ways that uh, a choose your own adventure. One would be for big data brokers to, uh, to do self-regulation like the payment card industry or high trust uh, uh, with healthcare. Uh, there are pros and cons. No one knows, uh, if, the, if you take that approach, no one knows their data better than they do. But then on the con, you have them policing themselves. Uh, then there's the... Uh, the legislative or the, the law angle for you uh, uh, being the legislative branch to put out. Um, the, the pros of that would be that it could apply to all, uh, all corporations. I think we're missing sight here that uh, we're talking about these big data brokers that have terabytes and petabytes of information, but geez, go look at any Silicon Valley company and they have almost as, uh, uh, Facebook, Google, they all have huge amounts, vast data stores of very sensitive data. So if, uh, if, if Congress is going to act on this, expand the scope and talk about minimum standards for, uh, for the privacy of data, define what private data and sensitive data is, and if I can give some advice here, set the bar pretty high because we don't want uh, legislation or self-regulation to be the minimum that organizations aspire to, and then they think, oh, I'm compliant, and then they can they can just kind of, oh, I'm not going to fund anything above that bar. And w we really don't want to see that in the industry. And Ms. Dixon, just uh, very briefly, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, you know, what, what kinds of regulatory constructs make sense? We're talking about the, the, the spectrum of self-regulation to potentially overreach on the part of the government, which, uh, which takes us away from some of the very positive aspects that come from responsible use of this information. What's a right size regulatory framework look like? Right. I agree with you on that. that we want good data uses and we want to curtail the harmful uses or the punitive uses. The, 
I've thought about this a lot, and I keep coming to the HIPAA rule. I do like how the HIPAA rule um, tamed an incredibly complex sector with flexible regulations that apply to a huge scope of company size and business structure. The data broker industry is quite complex. Uh, there, there are many, many permutations and types of businesses. Axiom is a large multinational business, but there are also small two-person mom and pops, so we're going to have to have something quite scalable. I like the idea of minimum security regulations and standards for data brokers because it, first, the, the larger participants are going to have different capacities than the smaller participants, but the smaller participants will be helped in they'll have a clear idea of what's expected of them and what, what are the minimum you know, necessary standards. Um, in terms of self-regulation, that's a good question. Of course, we all hold out hope for self-regulation, but as I mentioned earlier, in the data broker sector, Axiom is the only company that stepped forward and did any kind of anything having to do with self-regulation. The rest of the industry has not come along, and it's been two years. They've had ample opportunity, and they didn't take up the bar. Therefore, I think we've given them a fair shake, and I'd like to see some, especially in the area of security, I'd like to see some standards. Keep the data safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I believe a vote's been called, but we still have uh, quite a few minutes. Go ahead. Uh, I just have a couple of quick questions. Uh, in, in the bill that I am going to offer, state attorneys general, along with the FTC, would have enforcement powers, but the state attorneys general would have to yield if there were a pending federal action. I wonder, uh, Ms. Dixon, if that seems to you like a, a plausible and good way to enforce this law. I really liked how that bill was constructed in regards to enforcement with the state AGs. If you have an extremely active state AG with uh, feet on the ground and they, they see a, a harm right there, I really like the idea of the state AG being empowered to, to work on that. And I would imagine that there would be a collegial relationship between the, uh, the enforcement bodies and that could all be worked out. That answer certainly confirms my own experience as a former state attorney general that there is a collegial relationship and that in fact the areas of interest and objectives are very much consistent and in alignment. Uh, Mr. Caserta, I, I recognize that uh, your company was one of the first to come forward with some standards. Uh, at the same time, uh, I must say that uh, the Senate Commerce Committee, as you will recall in 2013, conducted an inquiry into how the data broker industry operates with specific focus on those nine companies, I mentioned them earlier, that sell consumer data for marketing purposes. And the report, as you may also recall, uh, said, quote, while some of the companies have been completely responsive to this inquiry, several major data brokers to date have remained intent on keeping key aspects of their operations secret from both the committee and the general public, end quote. Axiom was cited as one of those companies. Uh, quote, three of the largest companies, Axiom, Experian, and Epsilon, to date have been similarly secretive with the committee with respect to their practices, refusing to identify the specific sources of their data or the customers who purchase it. Uh, I'd like to ask you whether you can commit on behalf of your company that you will share the specific sources of Axiom's consumer data and the customers to whom you sell it uh, with this committee. Uh, I don't know that we and our constituents can trust data brokers if they operate completely behind the veil of secrecy. And I make this point to you because your company has been more at the forefront of this effort than lagging behind it. So it may be unfair to you because you're the one here, uh, which I commend you for being, but I feel compelled to ask you this question. Uh, yes, sir. The, uh, you know, I can't make that commitment, you know, direct up today. I would say that it's to have more dialogue on it, to come back and visit that. A lot of the, um, um, as I understand it, because I was not part of that, you know, discussion, but a lot of extremely proprietary 
extremely sensitive questions were being asked that's very dangerous to disclose, not from a consumer perspective, but from a competitive operations perspective and maintaining our ability uh, to operate with our intellectual property. Uh, so I want to be very careful with that, but I don't ever want to exclude the need to have the dialogue and to continue to have the dialogue. I'd like to have the dialogue. I respect that there may be proprietary interests yeah. at stake. I'm not aware of how they might impact, for example, the sources of information. I can understand maybe consumers or customers, rather, but uh, I would like to continue discussing it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We have time for the two. We've only had one round. Do you have one question for a minute? And uh, Yeah, I just have uh, one question for everybody. This is kind of a factual question, but I'm wondering how these requests come in and if there's a way to make sure that the requests come in in a certain way. So if somebody wants to say, um, I'd like to find all of the evangelical Audi-owning skiers who live in uh, west of the Mississippi, that's one thing. If they want to say, there's this guy named Justin Harvey and I want to know everything you know about him, that's another thing. Do you have a filter for what questions you allow people to query your data with? Yes, sir, we do. So we go through a, a, a basically use case analysis. What kind of a client is it? Somebody's going to ask a specific about an individual question. That's a very limited, very narrow permissible use for our risk product, collected only for that use and extremely limited and credentialed as to who can do that. Um, the general marketing questions tend to be much broader where they're not targeting individual. They're looking for behaviors and trying to generate a list of folks that might be interested in the next you know, pair of shoes or something like that. And uh, again, we differentiate on those use cases and apply that uh, you know, to all the client base that comes in and buys our products. Anything to add, Mr. Harvey or Ms. Dixon? I would say, I would just point back to uh, uh, the minimum requirements for the data. When Mr. Caserta was talking about his risk product and how they were going off of these use cases, I would just like to point out that I would want to hope, and I would probably assume, uh, that uh, all of the data is both, in, uh, the disk is encrypted, the data, when it's in the database, is encrypted, and while it's being transported into the area or the holding cell that the, that the customer comes into to grab or, or feed, that it always remains encrypted. Uh, as I said earlier, and I think uh, Mr. Caserta has done a good job in, in talking to us about how uh, serious they consider the data, but I would want it apply to all data brokers that all sensitive data, whatever the definition is, is always encrypted, but realize from a legislative point of view, it's not a silver bullet. So just very quickly, uh, it's incredibly important to understand that access controls, one of the great Achilles heels of all data brokers. And typically what we have seen in our research is that individuals who are trying to get a lot of information about uh, criminals who are trying to get a lot of inf information about individuals, they will, they will layer their efforts. In other words, they'll use one database here, one data broker there, and they'll combine the information um, that they're looking for. Um, at one point in 2005, a very famous data breach occurred. This was by Choice Point, where um, a fraud ring purchased access to background data checks. And this is the exact kind of access control problem that data brokers have to deal with. So a legitimate use, that of employment, can be spoofed very easily. So remote access, that's the big thing I think that uh, we need to really look at in terms of immediate security issues with respect to your question. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. This has been very enlightening. Uh, as we move forward on this, uh, we're going to need uh, help from people like you uh, to help us navigate this. And I, I appreciate the candor you expressed, and thank you for being here in one of the companies. And, uh, and also, I mean, this is difficult stuff. Uh, what may not be sensitive as one item in the aggregate becomes sensitive. And uh, these are the things that uh, make it difficult to legislate and uh, to navigate. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. The hearing record will remain open for one week. Uh, members who weren't here may submit questions for the record. And we ask you to promptly respond to those if you could. So thank you for being here. With that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.